Okay, well, thank everyone for coming for this is the uh, Center for Mind, Brain and Culture, as well as uh, Center for Translational Social Neuroscience uh, panel discussion about uh, some interesting work that I have been doing in collaboration with Reverend Patty Ricotta, who is also here today. Um, it's been a really uh, interesting twist of my own research uh, plan. So I, as I was thinking of, of how I would, uh, what I would say here today, I just reminded of, you know, 12 years ago in around 2010, 2011, uh, I started the Center for Translational Social Neuroscience. And the reason for that, uh, uh, creating that center was because I really wanted my work, which I'll tell you a little bit about today on the neurobiology of social relationships, uh, to have some impact for mankind, to have, have some way of you know, giving back to humanity in some way. And the way I thought about that for almost all the time that I have been here at Emory, which is now 29 years I've been at Emory uh, for quite a long time, um, the way that I had been thinking about my work on the neuroscience of social relationships and social behavior, uh, the translational impact of that was for uh, maybe helping uh, treat social deficits and psychiatric disorders uh, such as autism. So it was a more of a medical bent. Um, but uh, this all changed. I mean, I still think that way, and I'm still working really hard to uh, try to help uh, make improvements for social functioning and psychiatric disorders of all kinds. Um, but uh, today's talk, I'm going to talk about some work that really has uh, changed the direction that I have gone, and it all started with an email contact from uh, Reverend Patty uh, Ricotta. So Reverend Patty and I have been teaming up to do this uh, really important work, and we are really an unlikely duo. Okay, Patty is a reverend. She's a member of the clergy, and I am not. I'm a scientist. Uh, so I uh, think um, really mainly through the lens of science, and she thinks uh, from also biology, but also theology. Um, so I want to, let me share my screen now. So the, okay, so uh, a little bit about FGM. FGM is a practice that uh, occurs um, in several places around the world, um, uh, in several uh, Middle Eastern countries it is practiced, but it's also practiced in many places in Africa. FGM stands for female genital mutilation, and it is a practice that has uh, roots mostly in culture, I think, um, historical practices. It's not really aligned to religion. Um, although sometimes it, it can be in some ways. And uh, I have to say that uh, Catherine Jaunt is, uh, has been working with FGM from an academic standpoint a lot longer than I do, so I hope that she can uh, bring in some perspectives uh, on this at the end. Um, but this, this map just shows you that uh, in certain countries, especially uh, it, the work we've been doing has been in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, um, this suggests that around 25 to 50% of uh, women have experienced this FGM female genital mutilation practice. And this typically happens when the girls are around marrying age. And it is kind of a rite of passage a lot of times. It's a sort of, uh, once they have had this procedure, then it is time for them to um, get married in, in many cases. But although this, this map shows that 25 to 50% of females, uh, women in these areas have had this uh, female genital mutilation practice done to them, uh, in local areas, it's much higher concentration. So we've been in areas where it's up to, to 90%. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, widespread practice. And it's illegal in most places, maybe in every country in Africa, I'm not sure. But uh, even though it's illegal, all that has done is to cause this practice to be done, uh, to be hidden. And it is still practiced based on um, our experience. And so what I'm going to do now is let Patty talk a little bit about uh, how she got connected with me and my science and then my science. Okay, am I in the right place? And as it says it is. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Um, first, I just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you for being here, whether you're in the room or watching online. Uh, it's a real privilege to be working with Larry and to be part of, um, of uh, Emory because my story is now part of his story and these things are growing. So um, I, there was a picture, now how do I make, uh, um, 
So I have been working in East Africa for almost 20 years. And I started out working by sharing um, information from the Bible that shows that God intended men and women to be equal. And I know that's not something a lot of people know because it has a lot to do with translation and so forth. But I had been teaching at a conference in Kampala, and this man, Reverend uh, Robert Aroni, uh, came up to me during the break because I had just finished teaching about how the, in Genesis um, 1, 26 through 28, it says that God made man and woman in his own image. And R Reverend Robert was really floored by that idea. So he came up and he was like, ah, Patty, you must sit with me. And he says, you, you have told us something new. He said, we thought that women were made in the image of man and only men were made in the image of women. And so I said, where, where did you get that idea? And he said, from 1 Corinthians. And I said, but now you understand. And he said, yes, yes, I, I understand. Women and men are made in the image of God. And they were both given the responsibility to rule over the earth. And I was like, ah, I can go home happy now. But then he said something I was not expecting. He said, you know, because women are made in the image of God, just like men, maybe that means God doesn't want us cutting our girls. And I was taken aback, and he was talking about FGM, female genital mutilation. And I said, okay, so why do you cut your girls? And he looked at me like, are you crazy? He said, because if a girl can enjoy the pleasure of sex, then she won't be faithful. She'll be promiscuous and won't be a virgin for her husband. Or if a wife can enjoy sex, then she will stray from her husband and, and not be uh, faithful. And I said, okay, so faithfulness is important in marriage. And he said, yeah, of course. And so I said, well, then, Reverend, what do you cut off of the men to keep them from being unfaithful to their wives. And this was a man that I knew. So he was like, okay, I see your point. And then I pushed a little bit and I said, you know, Jesus says that in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he was like, oh, I never thought about it like that. So he said to me, you need to come and speak to the Sabine people because that's who he was working with. And uh, it took three years for the bishop to invite me to come. But we, I finally went and we started this work. Um, and it, but when Dr., uh, when Reverend uh, Robert said this, uh, I knew immediately that I had an information that could help people, any people, decide to stop the practice. Because my undergraduate degree is in biology and psychology, and I knew that um, I understood the reasons why God made that very precious part. And one of the, the first thoughts that came into my head was Dr. Larry J. Young, because of this paper that he wrote. And uh, I had read that paper in 2004, and I loved most of all this one sentence, I don't know if you can see it very well, but plasma oxytocin levels are elevated at the time of orgasm in women. So I knew that if people understood that when a woman has an orgasm, she, uh, her husband releases this massive dose of oxytocin in her called the bonding hormone, and it bonds the two together in love and faithfulness. So that's when I said, okay, I'll go. And uh, then the next thing I want to talk about is how this works. I'm sorry, this may be triggering for people. Larry, would you give me my water, please? Um, please don't look if this is something that is upsetting to you. The place where I started working was uh, the region of Sabe in eastern Uganda. And this is how it has been done. Girls go through a mentoring process. They're um, brought to the village uh, square with um, men 
Uh, everybody's looking, the boys are looking down to see who will be a brave, courageous Sabine girl uh, fit for marriage. And they're all just watching to see what happens. Um, and this woman is called a surgeon and she has no medical experience whatsoever, but she's been taught by her mother and her grandmother how to be um, a, a surgeon. And so she comes, lifts up the poor girl's skirt, cuts off in the Sabine region, um, the girl's labia majora, labia minora, and her clitoris. And then just, um, she has two months to uh, recover. And then she is married off to the man her father chooses, usually the man who will give her, give him the highest bride price. So that is what's happening. And uh, girls are more attractive if they don't scream or cry out during the ceremony. But of course, uh, if you do cry or you scream, you may never get married because you'd be considered a weakling. And also uh, a girl is ridiculed her whole life, her whole entire life, if she makes even a sound. There's no anesthesia, nothing. Uh, and some girls bleed to death and they have myths about why that happened. So when I was thinking about going to, uh, I had actually been working in Sebe for seven years when I was asked to come to Finland and give a talk. Uh, and I thought I had to get that quote, the one that I showed you about orgasm. And as I was writing, reading, rereading that article, I noticed there was a little blue link at the top with Larry's email address on it. And I thought, this guy should know how important his work is and how it is helping to bring an end to FGM. Because once I started teaching the Bible mixed with um, the science of bonding, people totally understood. They did not want to practice anymore. And even before Larry came uh, to work with me, I would have men come to me after a conference and, or they would even ask in front of everyone, now Reverend, can we put these things back in? because they understood that the reason their wives despised sex, so many of them left their husbands um, when they had the number of children they wanted. So they wanted to find a way to remedy this. And of course, the, you can't put it back in, but I encourage them that you can be the new ancestors, the ones who help your generation to do what needs to be done, because what the ancestors wanted was strong faithful marriages and now you have the science and the bible and you have this strong message and it just caught on like wildfire and that's why i wrote to larry that was in 2018 and i told him what was happening and asked him if he'd like to come with me and he's such a good sport <laughs> that he came um i think the the big thing, the thing that's different about what we're teaching than what other people are using is, um, and, and people have told me this, what has been used before to try to stop FGM is the mantra of women's rights. And of course, that's true. It is a, women's, a woman's right. But if you don't believe that women deserve to have rights, if you, don't, if you believe that women are inferior to men and are created in order to serve men, you won't listen to that message. And so that's why our message makes such a difference because it brings together um, the, the science of how God created, that's my word, not Larry's, how God created our bodies to work in perfect unity and harmony and to release this hormone oxytocin to bond us together. So I would bring together the Bible and uh, oh, Larry's going to come and talk about this. So it's working and it's working in ways that there aren't any other organizations that are using this message. And that's why uh, there are 
thousands of people who decided to stop the practice because of this. So thanks, Larry, for coming. Uh, yes, to talk about um, uh, the efforts that we've been doing since I started uh, going with Patty over there. So I have to say, that in the beginning, I was reluctant to join uh, with Patty because you know she had she comes from a theological background. She speaks from the Bible, and that's not the kind of message that that I necessarily want to give. Um, but you know, the, what she told me was so compelling uh, that that when uh, people heard about this biology of uh, the, the social behaviors and things like that, it was very compelling and it had the opportunity to potentially change the way people think about things. So I said, okay, we'll go, but let's go, let's speak to uh, some medical professionals as well, go to, uh, you know, have conferences. So we organized conferences where we brought in, we had four, three different conferences with uh, medical students and staff and hospital workers. And, and this is uh, one picture uh, from that. Um, but we also uh, went to, how are you making the slide go down? Oh, okay. Um, so so we, we uh, had these conferences and uh, I spoke about the biology, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a little, in a little bit. And yeah, it re really revealed to me that uh, the things that we were doing were impactful and salient to them. And one of the things that emerged is that FGM was only one of the issues that my work was uh, relating to over there, really. It was also, I learned a lot about uh, partner relationships. There's a very big cultural difference between uh, how men and women, women relate to each other in a marriage. Um, and that also led to a, a, a lot of domestic violence. I've had a lot of people discussing you know, how uh, big of a problem domestic violence is, and I happen to think that part of that domestic violence problem is related to FGM, uh, perhaps. But there's also issues about parent-child relationships, which is also my work is about, uh, loving the effect of uh, loving and nurturing uh, the off uh, babies. Uh, but also I could talk about autism. When I talked about autism to the hospital uh, workers and staff, they decided that they would uh, you know, start uh, developing behavioral uh, paradigms there to try to improve uh, um, function, social function. And I was actually able to uh, uh, do a little news spot. I'll just pl play a little clip from the, this is the national news in Uganda that played on Sunday night, one of the most watched television stations. But this will give you an idea of... Um, So, so that became quickly, uh, you know, a message that I went with is that, you know, this is good for everyone. You know, I, one of the things that I felt a little, little bit also um, worried about was trying to go over and impose my values, my ethics onto their culture, my culture onto their culture. And so that's one of the things that I really wanted to avoid. Um, but as I learned more about uh, the practice of FGM and talked to many more women, I, I realized that, that 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 is probably not an issue. I mean, it is an issue that we can maybe discuss later, but um, the, the women who have experienced this FGM 
I had really suffered a, a, quite a traumatic experience, and then a lifetime of not being able to have a pleasurable sexual relationship with their husband, which I'll tell you in just a moment is really important for creating that bond and also creating the health that allows you to you know, live a long, healthier life. So we went to Sabay and spoke. So our strategy is not to speak to just to individuals, but to try to pick uh, community leaders. So here in the Sabay, with the first conference that we did, uh, these were uh, tribal chiefs, uh, government uh, leaders, and uh, clergy, members of the clergy, both Christian and Muslim. And um, so we just went there and I gave the talk about my science. And we also, we were not coming in as outsiders on our own. Every time we give a talk there, we have someone from the community or someone in the area to give a talk. And this, uh, this woman who is speaking here is Damali. Uh, she is a registered nurse, uh, but also uh, her and her husband, who is a gynecologist, they own some hospitals in uh, Kampala. And she, and she was the one that was really speaking about FGM. I tried to stay pretty much away from speaking specifically about FGM, but really talking only about the biology of, uh, of relationships. But I, I just wanted to show you this because this is one of the slides that she showed there. These are the tools. These are the instruments that they use to do the the genital cutting, and they are not sterilized whatsoever. And uh, this is actually, uh, as she described it, this is a mixture of, I believe, red brick and uh, corn flour that they use to actually be able to grip the clitoris uh, to pull it so that they can do the cutting. And you can imagine that is not sterile whatsoever. And they have these beliefs that if a, if a girl uh, dies, from bleeding, from being cut, uh, that it is because that girl looked at a boy lustfully at some point uh, during in her youth. So, um, but the thing that really struck me after that very first conference was that after I talked, we had both. This is this is a group of uh, people that were at that first conference. There's a couple of uh, Muslim imams there, as well as uh, Catholic or not Catholic, uh, Anglican uh, priests. They came together to hear the science about a love and bonding. And so to me, that was really cool. And they all were equally enthusiastic. There was not a single person there that I've met and all of the conferences that we've done, which we've now done like 11, I believe, who would came to me afterwards and said uh, that they do not believe uh, what I talked about here. And so this is one, this was the first conference that actually we sponsored at Emory University. Uh, this was done at St. Paul's University right outside, out, outside of Nairobi. And there were 400 people there. And the cool thing is that these people that attended this conference came from five or six hours away. They drove across Kenya. And you know that was something that we facilitated with funding to be able to pay for the transportation as well as the rooms and food and things like this. But they came for this two-day conference to hear us talk. And these, again, are members of the clergy. We, we encourage people to bring their wives, but they're also psychologists, marital therapists, and things like this. And uh, one thing I want to mention too, back, going back to Sabay, this is Sabay is in West Uganda. After we left, we heard the people uh, reports that the priests, when they counsel couples, so 90% of, of the people there are either Christian or Muslim. And when they are now counseling their priests, they talk about, oxy, uh, sorry, they're counseling their couples that are getting married, they talk about oxytocin and importance of things like looking into the eyes and making you know, eye contact and social touch and all these kinds of things. So it really is um, grabbing hold there. But the cool thing is that these are all leaders. So they can all reach out to many more people and we give them our slides. So they're now giving these talks uh, into the community themselves. Another uh, interesting thing is this is a picture uh, of a bishop and a group of uh, priests that come from Meru, which is around Mount Kenya in the center of Kenya. They came five hours. They drove five or six hours that day. Uh, after the conference there, then they invited us to come back this year. So we were just there in, Janu in January, spoke to another three to 400 people, totally different people than we spoke to in the first time. So the message is really getting out to large numbers of people. Uh, this year, we also went uh, to Tanzania um, and we went to a safe house in Tanzania that, that uh, is a safe haven for little girls who are running away from uh, both uh, being cut, but also the domestic violence that comes uh, with that um, in that area. 
And uh, this conference we uh, organized, and here these guys that are sitting at this um, table are the uh, cultural leaders. Uh, they are trying to keep the cultural cu customs alive. But they came to hear uh, this, this talk as well. So one of the things that we did at this conference, because we wanted to learn from them, why, why is FGM valuable to you? Why do you practice this? And these are just, so we got them to break up into groups. Husbands and wives were split up. They communicated and they reported back to us why FGM is important for girls and women, you know, from the, from the women's perspective. And the answers, most common answers, it's, it's a rite of passage. It, it is marking a certain age when uh, it is a, you know, time to be married, um, becoming adulthood. Uh, but also that they, the, the women actually had heard that it was to help maintain fidelity because it makes sex so painful. Women are not going to be um, wanting to have sex with others because it is painful. It's also a sign of bravery and a sign of courage. And it also brings honor to the family. So this is why the women do it. Or this is why women think that it is important to do it to their daughters. Uh, when asked the men, uh, boys and men, why it's important for the girls or their wives to, to be cut, um, one, of the, one of the comments that people, uh, that the men mentioned here is that uh, the boy or the young husband doesn't have to worry about bringing pleasure to the girl during sex because that can be humiliating if he cannot bring her to orgasm, if she has this gear, if she has this sexual organ that makes sex be so pleasurable. Um, they also just saying things like uh, it can get in the way during sex. It, it makes it easier for the boy. So everything was from the boy's perspective of making sex more enjoyable to the boy, but not very much uh, from the girl's perspective. And of course, they also uh, talk about ensuring fidelity and also husbands would be proud to be married, uh, married to a cut girl. These are some of the things that they told us uh, was important in the community. At this conference in Tanzania, we also had the surgeons, some of the surgeons that were actually doing the surgery. And uh, this is a group of women that do the surgery. And this, this, this lady actually, after the conference, gave a testimony about the fact that she was cut as a young girl. She had a problem with her marriage, with her uh, having a baby. She had to go to the emergency room and all of that. And then after hearing us talk, she had tears in her eyes of uh, thanking us for um, giving them that, that information. And I just wanted to, uh, so, you know, some of the comments that people gave about, you know, the clitoris being in the way as an obstacle for having sex or also relating FGM to circumcision, I, I, I made a point to show them this picture. A lot of also people think that, that, that the clitoris is a male part that's in a female body. And so I wanted to also make the point that it's not. But before birth, males and female genitals look the same. Um, and uh, this part, uh, in a boy, because of testosterone, will grow into becoming a penis. And whereas uh, the female part, it will uh, develop into the vagina. And uh, so a circumcision, I wanted to make the point, is simply cutting the foreskin away from this. Whereas uh, removing the clitoris is like removing the entire penis. And um, I think that was pretty com compelling them, to them too. But I just wanted to, just a few days ago, we got... Uh, a newsletter, a report back from one of the conferences. And I just wanted to read some of this stuff because th this is kind of what has made me feel like, you know, I'm not really imposing my culture on other people, but they also really want to change. So for example, uh, this is from the Meru region where um, the bishops or the some member of the clergy wrote this that said 75 out of 100 girls and women are cut either willingly or, or unwillingly in this area. 75%. It's done even to women as old as 30 or 40 who get married without being cut. Uh, there are, um, they are times for when the, they go off to get firewood uh, in the forest or to gather water. Uh, and the circumcisors will actually you know, cut, uh, grab those women and do it uh, using those unsterile, unsterile and dirty tools. And often there is bleeding. So here you can see this is real. This is not just a cultural practice that's harmless. This is something that really is causing uh, damage to people. Uh, in December alone, 60 women were cut in that single uh, area. Okay. This has also struck me as kind of being uh, very uh, interesting. This is from a man's perspective. A man said this. 
Uh, we are in a cultural prison whereby we are forced to marry only cut girls because of societal norms. Um, uh, we are forced to cut our daughters against our will just to fulfill our cultural beliefs. Truly speaking, we do not like to cut women because they are like an empty shell. And this is something that you know, I heard over and over and over again when talking to women about their sexual experiences, they just simply have not the idea that sexual relationships with their husband generates pleasure. So I just now want to talk a little bit about my science so that you can understand why the science that we've been doing here at Emory uh, relates to uh, these issues that I've been talking about. So I was very careful when I started out my talk uh, that I learned from nature. I'm a biologist. I'm not going to say anything that comes out of the Bible. I'm going to speak about what we've learned from, from nature and from different animals. And uh, so these are the animals that I work on. These are called prairie voles. Uh, I have a colony of these here at Emory over at the Emory Primate Center. And what makes them a great model for studying monogamy and social relationships is these guys, once they mate, uh, they form a bond that lasts a lifetime. Generally, they raise offspring together. And we're able to study the neurochemistry and the neural circuitry of that process. Um, and one molecule, I'm going to talk about two molecules that everybody that we spoke to at all of these conferences can remember these two molecules. Uh, one is called oxytocin. Because half, half of the members in the audience have experienced oxytocin when they give birth. If they were mothers, they'd give birth. Oxytocin is a molecule that's made in the brain goes to the uterus at the time of birth, and it causes the uterus contractions, causes the labor, and causes the birth to happen. It's also the molecule that when the mother is nursing her baby, so the baby begins to suckle, it's released, and goes to the breast to cause the milk to be ejected. So this happens in all mammals. This oxytocin molecule is responsible for those two things. But what we also know is that it, it is acting in the brain at the same time to focus that mother's brain on that baby, on the cues of that baby, on the face, on the smell to create a very strong bond between that mother and that baby. And uh, I had this video that a friend, our driver uh, in Uganda gave us. This is a, a, a gorillas up in um, Lindy, uh, Bwindi. Um, I haven't seen them yet, but I want you to just take a look at how gentle this mother gorilla is when she's nursing this baby. And this kind of connection, th and, and this is also how I, I was able to convey to them that humans and animals have a lot of similarities. We have a lot of the same, we have almost all the same brain parts. We've got the same neurochemistry and that oxytocin that is being released into that mother and going into her brain is causing that bond. Uh, that is the same molecule that creates a bond between male and female, husband and wife, mates uh, in different species as well. And so I, you know, talked about, you know, how when that mother is nursing that baby, her brain is focused on that baby and she's learning everything she can about that baby, all of the, the features of that baby. I use the example of these uh, zebras that, you know, all the baby zebras look the same to, to us, but if a mother zebra is giving birth, she learns quickly the stripes of her baby and she nurses her baby and she will defend that baby and she'll risk her life to save that baby, but she will not nurse other babies. So it's a, it's a molecule of bonding. And that's a very faithful process. That bonding is very faithful. So uh, everybody could understand that process. Um, and so the other key element to this oxytocin is that, um, well, uh, oxytocin not only causes the bond between the mother and the offspring, but also uh, between these animals, uh, between these voles. So you can inject oxytocin into two animals, even if they don't mate, you can induce this bond between them. Um, and the other key element is that where oxytocin is acting, this is the, an area called the nucleus accumbens. It's the brain's reward pathway. It's the area that's involved in addiction. It's where dopamine acts to create pleasure, reward, and addictions. Uh, and it turns out that this is where oxytocin acts to create the bond between partners. And in fact, um, well, this slide is also to show that animals that do not bond, unfaithful animals, do not have oxytocin in that, oxytocin receptors in that area. So they actually learned a little bit of uh, neurochemistry in this. But I emphasize that if you look in the human brain, the human brain also has oxytocin receptors in this nucleus accumbens area. And those oxytocin receptors are activated and activate the nucleus accumbens, the same brain area, when men look at photographs of their partner. 
Uh, I'm not going to be able to show all of the slides that I that I showed then, but uh, the, uh, it really made a compelling message. So uh, the chemistry of bonding is not just oxytocin. Oxytocin is what makes the of the baby salient. There's also another molecule that's really important, and that is dopamine. So the sexual interaction, the interaction between the, the male and the female has to be pleasurable in order for this chemical cocktail. So it's a cocktail that has to happen. It is, you have to have clarity of vision of your, of your partner, a perception of your partner, but also you have to have that reward, that reinforcement. And then that bonding is kind of like an addiction to a partner. And um, that is something that I think uh, because of the lack of um, pleasure in sex. Uh, you know, women were telling us that when the men want sex, they just demand to have sex right then, and there's no pleasure whatsoever. It's part of their duty to have sex, to have children, but it's not part of that relationship. And so this is something that they are all missing. Yet every woman that I talked to really wanted that in their, in their life. Yeah. Oh, there. Um, I just wanted to add that um, when Larry is talking, this man has a superpower, okay? Actually, he's got two superpowers. One is that even though he's a scientist and uh, doesn't ever mention anything about the Bible, he has such respect, not only for me, but for all of the people that we serve. And because you can't reach people if you cut off half of their brain and say, okay, you do what I tell you to do because this is women's rights. But they're going, uh, you know, if you have a strong belief, then you need to address that as well. And so one of the things that I appreciate, because he said he was worried about working with me. I was worried about working with him too. <laughs> Because you, he could say something that could undermine all the work I've done because I'm trying to build a, a relationships of equality between men and women from the biblical perspective. And there is a biblical perspective, but I was really worried about it, but he has such respect and pays attention to every single person that he's talking to. It's like, it's very clear that all he wants to do is help people with his science. And they absorb it because there's nothing fake about him. He's very authentic. And that's part of it. But also, uh, I know he's gonna show the picture um, of he and um, Anne, his wife, but when men say things like, you know, oh, I just wanna, you know, just use her, Larry goes, are you kidding? I, I, I do anything to make my wife happy. I enjoy making my wife happy. And the men are totally stunned. They're like, what? And he's American. He's a this, he's a that, he's a that. And the women just melt. They're like, oh, you know, so that's one of his superpowers that he can be so authentic and respectful of my um, spirituality and the people we work with. Larry Young's other superpower is that the man will eat anything, anything. And people love to watch him eat. You know, you, the way to someone's heart is through the food they pre present to you. But he can eat it all. And I appreciate that, that is a real superpower. Talking about the food that they at the conference. Yeah. I eat all the food at the end. It's all, all great. Not just that. He goes to the market. Oh, I had so many pictures, but we don't have time. But okay. if you ever want to see the pictures of what this man will eat, you know, it makes it easier because sometimes when I bring people with me, they don't want to eat the food and they're, ew, uh, you know, and it's hard because these people have used a lot of money um, to be able to provide that meal. So Larry just eats it all and asks for seconds. So just thought I'd put that in. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to just 
just to continue with a little bit of the science, because a lot of these messages I think are important. And you know, I make the, the I emphasize the point that oxytocin is not just a mother hormone. It's not just in women. It's both in men and women. And oxytocin is a molecule that's really involved in us connecting with others. Okay, and it's important in society. Everybody wants their children to be healthy and be able to be highly connect, connected to other people. And oxytocin is a molecule that helps us not only bond, but really to connect to others and to be able to form relationships. And this is being successful. So I much about FGM, right? Yeah, um, started talking, but rather about, you know, other things that I think are really, really important to people. So uh, this is just another way, you know, I use these kind of uh, visuals that I think are very compelling. I use the same one in every talk that I give, whether it's Harvard, Stanford, or there in the uh, Bay. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, uh, uh, if you think about a computer screen, there's noise there. Uh, even if there's an image behind there, if there's a lot of static in there, you don't really perceive what that image is. But if you had a dial that could turn down the noise, so they increase the signal, then you can see the cues there. And that's what oxytocin does in the brain. That's what we've learned through hardcore neuroscience research uh, here at Emory, as well as in other places. And if that's cue is a social cue, uh, then we can use that information to be um, uh, to help us to others. But uh, it, again, related to, to bonding, okay, the two most potent stimulators of oxytocin release are nipple stimulation that occurs during nursing um, and also vaginal cervical stimulation that occurs during birth. But those two things also in humans happen during sex. So I, I think that our biology is sort of organized to activate this maternal bonding circuitry, both in men and women, to create the bond between uh, the partners. But also important is social touch and eye gaze. So one of the things that we learned over there uh, in terms of couple relationships is that in many of these places, maybe not so much in the Kampala in the city, but especially in the rural countryside, men do not want their wives to look at them in the eyes. So they basically don't have eye to eye contact. They have very little social uh, social touch either. Even when the, the men are walking down the street, often the women, this is one of the, the quotes from the, the leader of the church there in Tanzania. You have a, a husband is walking, he'll be walking 10 meters in front of the, the wife and also complaining to her the whole time. And so it's like, you know, this notion that husbands and wives can really relate to each other. It's just a cultural difference that, um, I try to convey, you know, why it is important to maintain those kinds of bonds. We also heard a lot about domestic violence and abuse and things like that. And here's some work that I showed them because it really relates to trauma early in life and neglect. So these are these voles again. And this is work that we did where we were able to uh, take the voles and do, give them a little social isolation for three hours a day for the first two weeks of life. So they're missing social contact during that time. And what we find is that when they grow up, those animals that had that in neglect uh, have a difficulty in forming bonds later in life. And we um, know that that has to do with oxytocin signaling early in life, the nurturing or the lack of nurturing that they get, that they are, uh, the, the nurturing that they are not getting when they are in this neglect paradigm is not building the social circuitry of the brain to be able to form relationships. And so this is where we talk about, you know, uh, parents, you want your child to be able to form relationships. You want them to be, you want to use their natural biology to form bonds. But by doing practices like this, whether it be through uh, abuse, beating, neglect, or FGM, all of these things are sort of going against the biology that helps individuals form these kinds of relationships. And um, and this is another example, I think, uh, remind me to tell about the, the fathers in the, the community, in the room. So, this is another example of showing that in humans, uh, that when parents and fathers play with their children, uh, it releases oxytocin into their brains as well. So this is a study where uh, they took fathers of little babies and gave them either intranasal oxytocin or placebo and told the fathers to play with the child. And then they measured the oxytocin in the father. And of course, if the, if the father sniffed the oxytocin, he had a lot of oxytocin in his saliva. That's not surprising, the placebo, not so much. What they found is that when the fathers got this oxytocin, they played with the baby more. They looked into the eyes more. They engaged. They did reciprocal uh, interaction, mimicking each other kinds of things. And then when they measured that oxytocin in the infant, they could see that rise in that oxytocin in that infant um, just through that parental interaction. 
And this was very compelling to them to, to make the point that when you have a child, interacting with that child, nurturing that child day in, day out, throughout its development, it can help build its brain in such a way that it will be adapted into the social environment and it can be successful. So I tried to talk about how to you know, create children that will then be themselves be successful. Oh yeah, so at the conference in Meru, there was a bunch, there was probably four or five fathers there. And before I gave this uh, slide, uh, the mothers were holding the babies. The fathers were not even looking at the babies, not doing anything. They were even sitting in different places in the room. But later on in the conference, after I gave this lecture, we could see the fathers were carrying their babies everywhere. So just having that information change it. It's not that it's against their culture to do that, but it's, it's, it's the lack of knowledge. So I really feel that what we're doing there is giving knowledge, not telling them what they should or should not do, but give them the knowledge so that they can change their own behaviors um, the way that they uh, feel is helpful to their, to their children. Here's another example that uh, comes from the work that we've done here. And I won't show you the bowl work here I did there, but uh, basically what we find is that in the bowls, if they are pair bonded and then they're separated from their partner and they lose their partner, they become depressed. They give up. Um, under difficult situations, they don't, they fail to thrive almost. They're, they release stress hormones. Now, this is even just from being separated for an X number of days. And so, um, you know, I talk about how oxytocin and dopamine together are help create the bond. But now I, I move into talking about the importance of that bond for your mental health as well as the physical health. And this is where I talk about the picture that, uh, of my wife. And, and um, so I talk about the two phases of bonding in that, uh, you know, that this missing the partner when you're away from your partner is probably a mechanism of maintaining the bond for a long period of time. So uh, this is a picture of my wife when we got married about 15 years ago, maybe a little more, 18, yeah. Um, but on, on the beach of Costa Rica and around the same time that we uh, got married, we also got this little puppy dog. And uh, when I, when we first got married, every day when I would come home from work, both my wife and my puppy dog would be equally excited to see me. Uh, but now, this is my wife. Now, this is the puppy dog. Now, and every day when I come home from work, my dog is still excited to see me. My wife, not so much excited. You know, so excitement has faded. But and that relationship changed over time. Yet when I'm away from my wife for two or three weeks, like when I go to these conferences, I miss her very much. And that missing that wife is what creates some negative affect that makes me want to come back home. I could stay there, but I come home to my wife. And so this is something I think that was also very compelling to them. They love that. They love to see uh, talking about my, my wife there. But I also make the point, there are other studies in these little rodents that show that if they are separated from their partner and you put human lung cancer cells into their body, they suc suc succumb to that lung cancer. Okay, faster than if they are still bonded. And so there's actually chemicals, you know, we don't quite know how it works, but things are happening in the brain when we're in these relationships that help maintain not only mental health, but physical health. So I tell them, if you want to live a long time, if you want to live a long, healthy life, you can't just be living with someone. Okay, but you really need to have a relationship with that person that helps foster this, and this is bi the biology's, uh, the system that has emerged in biology to make uh, individuals healthy, um, humans, for example. So cardiovascular disease, and I think that the median lifespan there is like 58 years old. And you know, part of that is maybe because they don't have these relationships. I remember talking to some of the individuals there where you know, in one tribe you might have, um, you have the cutting, but you also have, uh, monogamy or uh, polygamy with multiple wives or so maybe after um, yeah, 45 years of age or something the husband will get a new wife or whatnot but other tribes they don't do that and I think it would be a really interesting study to see if they live longer and that's the kind of research that can come from this you know uh, in the same areas but having different practices uh, can you actually increase the lifespan of people there but I think it's very clear to me that you would increase happiness uh, because the, uh, the, couple, the the relationship is really a contract. And that contract seems to be over when she is no longer um, fertile, when she goes through menopause and then she will 
often gain another, the husband would gain another wife. So I ended my talk with a slide like this, you know, uh, my advice for having a long and, and strong marriage was think of ways that will increase oxytocin and dopamine in your husband or wife. Looking into the eyes. Patty did a demonstration, I have some pictures at the end, when making husbands and wives get together and look at each other. And they got so giggly. And, you know, you could see the oxytocin and dopamine being released. I talked about flowers or giving gifts or, or any of these things that can release dopamine. And the women were all very excited about that. And the men, I think, they believed it. So... Um, but also stopping cultural practices that prevent bonding in future generations. You know, one of the comments that I uh, that I gave in Tanzania was, you know, all cultures have practices that are somehow damaging and wrong. Um, and so, you know, I, the example in my culture, we eat certain kinds of foods that are, you know, uh, high sodium pork, you know, uh, salt cured pork. I stopped doing that. That was my culture because I learned from information about how that was detrimental for my health. And so I tried to get them to think in the same sort of ways um, and then learn from nature. Um, and then uh, I would end with this slide. And Patty thought I should put that in there because that shows you know, me and my wife uh, together enjoying each other. Um, and I think um, that had a big impact on, on everyone uh, as well. So. Um, just in with a few more pictures here before we then go into uh, a panel discussion. But this is the, this is the um, conference that we did. These are all school teachers, or school teachers and psychologists and counselors. These are people that interact with with young people. And uh, so this this uh, gentleman who's standing over to the side that he's an interpreter. So we usually had to have an interpreter, a local person to do the interpretation. And uh, what um, I'm not sure what he was talking about here. Uh, everyone seemed to be enjoy it, enjoying it. But uh, one of the things that he said that after he saw my lecture last year uh, was he is a uh, chief of Del Mar Mangusha, who is a chief in a local area. So that means he's kind of like county commissioner or something of a large area. And he had the, you know people, little boys in his community that were you know drinking alcohol all the time. You know cheap homemade alcohol. They were being, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, breaking laws and not doing anything for themselves. And after hearing the talk about how, you know, the nurturing releases the oxytocin and it helps build the social structures and stuff, he just simply changed this practice of dealing with those guys and showed them some love. And he said that that worked miracles. So just changing rather than doing only punishment, Trying to activate the dopamine and the oxytocin system is just a frame, a changing the, the way that you interact with others. And he started doing it in his office and, and everything. So uh, that was pretty cool to hear about. We also went this time, this was in Tanzania. Uh, this was a safe house that I mentioned early on. And these are little boys and girls who had been running from either cutting or also the domestic violence. So I was really shocked at how much domestic violence and how, how often the domestic violence came up. And this is one of the things that psychologists and counselors really uh, focused a lot on was that there's a lot of domestic violence and they think it is because there's a lack of real uh, sort of connection between the husbands, husbands and the wives. And, and then this is Patty's uh, strategy. I don't know, do you, you wanna talk about this, Patty? This is the last two slides, I think. I'll be quick, but... Um... One of the things that adds to the impact of the science is that I match it with scriptures from the Bible that talk about equality. And a, a lot of people um, know that the Bible says that uh, women are uh, were created to be helpers to men, but there's a, the word after that. It's not speaking about a, an assistant, somebody who does, washes your socks and cleans your, it's a powerful source of help in the image of God. But then the next word is that it's translated as she will be suitable for him. But in the Hebrew, the word is um, konegdo. And it's a compound word. It means that the woman was created to be face to face with the man, not behind him, not below him, and not out of sight. So Larry had just given the talk about how gazing into each other's eyes releases oxytocin in each other. And that's a very difficult thing for East Africans, women to do. 
they, they don't even have permission to look in their husband's eyes. So I said, yeah, but God said that you're supposed to be face to face. So I bring them together and just have the husband stand here and the wife stand here. And I say, now, what can you do when you're face to face that you can't do when you're behind? And they all start giggling, you know, and they're like, well, we can talk to each other. We can gaze into each other's eyes. We can kiss. And then finally they get to sex and everybody starts clapping. So they see that the science, the reason God said you're supposed to be face to face with each other is because that's how he made our science. That's how he made our biology to work best. You bond when you look at each other, when you converse with each other. So it's an awful lot of fun to see them put the science together with the Bible. And Larry loves these pictures. So everywhere we go, I do this. And the people have such a great time. And this woman, afterwards we had lunch, she came up to me and she said, I want to tell you a secret. And I said, okay, what's the secret? And she says, I love my husband. I love him very, very much. And I said, really? I said, that's so sweet. And she said, I love that man. And he loves me too. And it's, it was just a really wonderful thing um, because they're putting this together and they know why they love each other now because they have the science that goes with it. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so um, that's all we wanted to show with slides now. I would like to uh, have um, the panelists, Dr. Yant and uh, Connor come up and we're gonna sit up front and we're gonna figure out how to get this camera. Uh, Oh, this one is on. Um, I was really looking forward to getting some other kinds of perspectives because the only you know thinking that I have done on this is on is on our trips with uh, you know the last couple of years. So I'd like to start some kind of dialogue about uh, some of the issues around you know trying to stop cultural practices like FGM and and whatnot. And I know Dr. Yank, you've been involved in this for a very long uh, time, and uh, Mel. You've been thinking about things of this nature for a long time as well. So you're in the Department of Anthropology. And uh, so since you have your, your microphone is all ready, did you, did you want to um, uh, yeah, start uh, off? I suggested that, that I start because uh, I'm not going to talk about myself, uh, but about uh, Molly Melching and Tostan mostly. And um, but I, I want to say today is, would have been my mother's 114th birthday. And she was the first of the women that I admired and loved. And I'm sure she didn't know about uh, this, but if she did, she would have been shocked. So I'm dedicating my <laughs> remarks to her. Um, so, um, Postan is, uh, T-O-S-T-A-N, is an uh, organization study by I started by uh, Molly Melching in 1974 in West Africa. So there's no competition going on here for this. Uh, in uh, Senegal mostly and and uh, Reverend Okada and Dr. Young are, are in Kenya and East Africa. And there's plenty of work for you to do in between if you get interested <laughs> in this. Um, but um, she, she, uh, her work has uh, uh, was eventually supported by the Gates Foundation. Melinda Gates wrote about her in her book, uh, and there's a nice interview online with Melinda Gates. Chelsea Clinton also wrote about her in her book, and um, um, thousands of of villages have been uh, have gi have given this up as a result of uh, the Tustan program since 1974. And, and um, the program is not focused on this. It's, it's a general program of health, especially women's health and women and promoting women's uh, rights. So it includes uh, education about child marriage and, uh, and abuse and, and other things. And they're very, um, uh, they're adamant that that they don't um, take any kind of confrontational approach and they don't even like to inter 
just their focus as being on 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 this. Uh, although, I mean, the other big difference is that you have oxytocin, and, uh, and they don't, and and that appears to be a very important uh, uh, lever in in uh, teaching and and persuading people. After all, um, what we're talking about here is removal of the 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 only human organ that has no purpose except pleasure and the bonding that is that that is fostered by pleasure and 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 the um the operation tends beyond uh clitoridectomy uh, 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 to cutting in many places to cutting of the labia and sewing the labia together and um um it, it's 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 very it's varied and extensive. Uh, I should say when I when I talk about, and one of the reasons that I uh, that I think this is very important that I talk about it with students is that uh, there's no subject that uh, more directly engages uh, attention on the concept of cultural relativism, which I think is anthropology's greatest contribution to human discourse. Uh, but it focuses our attention also on on the difference between cultural relativism and ethical relativism. So what is what what cultural relativism is not that you have to accept all cultures practices, uh, um, but that you have to understand them and and get people's own explanation for them before you you uh, start passing judgment. And um, so, so I also I also like to mention that uh, Indonesia is a country that has a lot of this, and um, it's, I think it's important to to mention that because you know, uh, otherwise there's there's a tendency to just connect it to Africa, and that that that's wrong, although it's most common in in a lot. Uh, of Africa from uh, the Sahel uh, and and um, so what they what they say in in Tostan is that they the program takes three years and they go in not talking about this but talking about health and 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 education and and uh, eventually about women's rights they recruit women to their side they. Um, they put uh, others to their side, and and um, I remember in one interview, um, Molly Melching said said that early on, um, it was a village in which she had spent a lot of time, and and village headman or chief spoke publicly and said, "We are not the kind of people who do this kind of thing." And then she knew that that her program had been uh, a success. I do, I do want to um, mention something about the terminology uh, because they don't use FGM; they only use female and genital cutting. And um, what what uh, one of the leaders said about this in a letter to someone who posed the question. Uh, we must use words, and so among these options, Tostan has chosen the term female genital cutting based on what communities that are giving up the practice have told us. The term cutting allows them to accomplish more than the others because it is less judgmental and value-laden. As a result, the term is more effective for engaging groups in dialogue around this practice and eventually bringing about its end. And it goes on, uh, let me be very, very clear. We do not use this term in an attempt to excuse or diminish the impact of the practice. I think anyone who has taken time to learn about Tostan knows that we are very far from hiding or excusing the real significant consequences of this practice. Yet despite its serious health consequences, we have found that FGC is not done with the intent to mutilate a girl. Rather, parents uh, and, and both... Um, Robert Ricotta and, and Dr. Young have emphasized as parents uh, have their daughters cut 
want the best for them. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but in our experience, if there's a dominant emotion involved in FGC, it is love. And that is counterintuitive, and it, uh, I don't know if you can fit that into the oxytocin narrative, but um, um, I had an old friend who, who ran an institute for conflict resolution in, in Northern Ireland, and she, she was very instrumental in helping to bring about the peace in Northern Ireland. And whenever she referred to the capital of Northern Ireland, she said, Derry, London, Derry. So those are the two names. Derry is used by Catholics. London Derry is used by Protestants. Derry London Derry is a very big mouthful, but she invariably said it that way, because otherwise she would have taken the sides. It was one of the first things out of her mouth. And I started thinking today, maybe to say FGC, FGM, uh, uh, instead of just uh, uh, FGM, uh, there is a little bit of a, a, a snag because C could also stand for circumcision, and this really is nothing like male circumcision, as Larry pointed out. But um, female genital cutting is, is is a more neutral term, and and might might allow us to uh, get inside the the minds of people doing this. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Yeah. Can, can I make a point to that? I admire Molly Melching so much. There were three years between the time that I started, uh, that I was invited by Robert Aroni to come and the bishop allowed me. I have read every single page on her website. I've read, I started by reading Half the Sky. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I learned it. I was devouring it. When I got to Sabe, I did call it FGC, I, and they didn't know what I was talking about. And so for the exact same reasons that Molly uses FGC in, uh, in Senegal, I use the words that they use mm -hmm. in uh, Uganda. And it, a new thing, it, when we were in Tanzania, they don't call the women, uh, they don't call them women, they say the victims. So I always try to mirror their language. Uh, otherwise, I would still be using FGC. And in the areas where I work, nobody knows what that means. So but that suggests there's already been a lot of progress mm -hmm. in those places. Uh, for, for Maybe pro have yeah. about progress among some people, the, especially the, you know, the leaders that came to our conferences. Um, but in Meru, as I as I pointed out, they still said that seventy five percent of women there in that area are still being cut. So there is, uh, you know, some progress being met, being made among some people, uh, but those people may be in leadership permit, uh, positions. And now those leaders all have those have our presentations, and they are actually giving the these same teachings in their. Um, in the churches and other community uh, places. So um, maybe we'll get further progress from that. Yeah. Unfortunately, millions of women are going to be cut this year. Yep. And that is very hard to change. Yep. Well, I just wanted to thank you, Susan. Wanted to thank you, Larry, for inviting me and um, for finding out about videos in, in which I appeared that I didn't even know about. Um, uh, I, I, I'll tell a little bit about my own history in, in my connectedness with this because I've had ambivalence over the course of my career uh, doing research on this practice for some of the reasons that Mel discussed. Um, but let me start with just a story that has to, I think, emphasize the importance of, of messaging and the, the intrigue that I have had listening to your talk today because um, I did my own doctoral research in Egypt and spent two years living there uh, with the prevalence of FGMC, and I, I use the term that's now coined by the WHO and countries have uh, endorsed that are engaged with the sustainable development goals. Um, but the prevalence of the practice in the aggregate was 97%. So 97% of women experiencing um, 
some form of female genital cutting or mutilation. The important thing, though, was that the form of the practice in Egypt was among the most mild. Um, sometimes uh, a minor nick, and I use the word minor in relative terms, of course, um, a minor nick of the clitoris, uh, perhaps some removal of the labia minora. Um, but the initial campaigns for abandonment were focused on public health messaging, so I'm providing a critique um, of my own field. And those public health advocates were not um, really fully informed about uh, the form of the practice that was most prevalent in the setting. Um, and some of the health effects that have been identified with more severe forms of the practice related to labor and delivery, related to um, severe uh, bleeding, um, more often are related to more severe forms of the practice. So the public health messaging that was conveyed uh, in an effort to support abandonment of the practice was not resonating uh, with many women uh, in this setting. So that's an example of um, public health efforts that failed effectively to resonate um, with local populations. So in 1995, 94-95, uh, there was a conference in Egypt, the International Conference on Population and Development, um, and FGMC was raised as an international uh, um, issue. Uh, in that context, an international women's rights issue, um, as well as a public health issue. We were just in the field of collecting uh, population-based data on the practice. We included um, some fairly interesting questions about FGMC and were able to look at cohort changes in the practice by asking mothers about the experiences of each of their daughters. So we could actually look at um, changes in the prob age-specific probability of the practice by asking moms about their daughters. Um, during the conference, um, a girl died from FGMC, and that created um, a lot of national shame and embarrassment. It also created a stir to the extent that um, the colleagues with whom we were working uh, asked if we would not publish anything from the data that we were collecting mm -hmm. on FGMC. So it's my first experience of um, uh, sort of the conflict between academic freedom and censorship of politically sensitive data on practices that um, run the risk of uh, um, um, major international reputational shame and damage uh, for countries in the context of these international dialogues. Um, so uh, I waited uh, to publish these data. What I already knew was that the practice was in decline among Christian minority groups um, in Egypt. And so um, in some senses, there was good news to convey, right? Um, because declines were underway in particular religious groups. Um, and in some senses, not good news to convey because um, majority Muslim populations, we were not seeing the same kinds of decline. So this um, sort of contextualized affiliation of FGMC with uh, religion as an expression of gendered identity um, in international context is something that has interested me for quite some time. And so Christian groups were differentiating themselves um, by affiliating with international agencies and funders for developmental aid and FGMC became part of a um, Christian-based campaign for women's empowerment. Um, so we eventually um, shared that, um, but I just wanted to underscore how sensitive mm -hmm. these conversations are and how serious the implications can be for local individuals um, who are identified as being affiliated with uh, practices like FGMC that suddenly become politically charged and sensitive. Um, so I did respectfully wait uh, to publish those findings until my colleagues and country uh, became comfortable. But the third thing I wanted to share um, is um, 
our own, well, actually a student's experience who collaborated in country um, on a qualitative study looking at stories uh, between husbands and wives who uh, were identified as having different severities, the wives having different severities of FGMC. Um, so in the Amhara, um, Amhara region of Ethiopia, uh, there tend to be um, a wide constellation of practices, including some of the most severe forms. And I really appreciated the stories that you shared uh, from both the husbands and wives' points of view about the implications of the most severe forms of the practice for uh, sexual pleasure, for relationship and bonding uh, between partners. And we um, earned the trust um, of these individuals who shared their stories. And it was the, uh, I had real ethical, uh, a second round of ethical dilemmas um, about publishing these findings because of the extremely traumatic stories that women told who had been, uh, who had experienced infibulation. These were traumatic stories of rape at first merit, at, at first intercourse, um, of days, uh, it requiring days uh, to achieve penetration because of uh, the suturing of the labia. Um, so these were experiences that were traumatic for women, severely, physically, emotionally, psychologically traumatic for women, also for their spouses um, mm -hmm. who were expected uh, to, ex in, as ways to express their masculinity, to achieve penetration um, at the and, and to consummate the marriage. So traumatic experiences of rape um, associated with infibulation to the point where women had extreme aversion uh, to the, in their partnerships, um, ran away. Uh, they often, um, in the sample, I'll speak specifically for the sample, were child brides. So we're married at very young ages. So I really appreciated mm -hmm. the stories that you have elicited about the constellation, the connection between FGMC, child marriage, and experiences of abuse and violence in marriage. Um, so um, I found the story that you shared today really compelling mm -hmm. um, because it is a story that both men and men and women in heterosexual re relationships can really identify mm -hmm. with. Um, and so that gets me back to the importance of messaging. And I am really curious to mm -hmm. see where your work goes mm -hmm. because of the universality mm -hmm. of bonding and partnership mm -hmm. and pleasure and love in the context of marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to thank you for the invitation mm -hmm. yeah. to come and join the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I was really impressed by is, you know, across religion, Christian, Muslim, you know, everyone experiences love and bonding at some level, uh, especially, you know, women having children. And so everybody can appreciate that. They can also appreciate how mother animals, you know, are will risk their life to save their baby and to being highly, you know, faithful to their baby. And so I think that the message Really, we didn't hear anyone uh, sort of argue or say they did not believe or they they, they understood it too. And and they're using the word oxytocin and, and dopamine. And you know the science that I teach is 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 the same science as I, I talk other places. But maybe I make it a little bit more relatable to someone without a biology background. But um, yeah, did yeah. you want to say something? I, I'm, Catherine, I'm glad you shared that uh, about the the trauma because. Even before I started working with Dr. Young, I would tell people, and now he backs me up, which I love, um, that when a woman wants to, who's, who's gone through FGM, when she wants to get away, when she wants to not uh, participate in sex, it's not because, and I say this to the men, it's not because she's a bad wife or she's a disobedient person wife or however you look at that it's because god has created the, another hormone called cortisol which is the fight or flight hormone and when you feel fear when you know that something's painful that's a hormone that tells you this is dangerous get away and when i say this to men it's one of the 
most intense things, you can see their face because they have sometimes beat their wife for not submitting or done something else. And many women, in especially in Subay, when they have the number of children that they want and the oldest one has grown up, because they haven't bonded to the husband the way their bodies are created to do, because she doesn't have any oxytocin, she leaves her husband alone and goes and lives with the oldest child. But that pain, when the husbands learn, when men learn that they're, they're not only not getting that amazing dose of oxytocin when they're having the pleasure of mutually um, wonderful sex, his wife is getting a dose of cortisol that makes her need to either fight him or flee from him. And that cortisol also, or the CRF, actually fights against the oxytocin. So it yeah, counteracts yeah. it. Another message that I didn't mention here, but, you know, because we have many women in the audience who have been cut, uh, emphasizing that, you know, it, it's not that you can't experience oxytocin and bonding without the clitoris, um, but you simply need to be cognizant. If, if you think about these hormones and how they act and then engage with each other with social touch, you know, caress, uh, looking into the eyes and all the things, you know, I, I try to convey that whenever you feel like you have a connection with someone else through looking into the eyes, through touching, smiling, giving a gift, eating together, doing all these kinds of, that's why I show that last picture of me and my wife sitting there. But there's, it's not that all is lost if you, if you don't have that. It's certainly, if sex is painful, then you're missing one important aspect, I think, it, which is the natural biology of human bonding. Um, but there are ways of, of getting around that. And um, I think that's also an important message. Yeah, and we we give them, I, I have one slide that says, all is not lost. And we give them ideas of things that they can do to elicit or, or to release oxytocin in their wives. And the first time I did that was at a men's conference. And I told them, you know, in the middle of the day, call your wife and say, honey, I was just thinking about you and I, I wanna pray for you. What can I pray for you today? Or I'm going to the market, can I get something for you? Or go home and say, you've had a long day, go have a cup of tea with a neighbor. And the men are like, really? That, that, would, that would work? And the women are just like swooning. And they're like, oh, I would feel so wonderful if that happened. So I gave the men homework that first night. I always give them homework. I say, on the way home, I want you to think of the things, three things that you love about your wife so much you would marry her all over again. And then tell her those three things and come back and report to us. And when they came back the next day, um, there were so many adorable stories. But one man said, he was an older man. It was in his like early 70s. And he said that, um, he said, well, I told my wife the three things. And he, then he just sat there and I said, come on, what, what happened? And he said, I was shocked. And I was like, oh no, something backfired. And he said, she looked at me and she said, why in 30 years have you never said that? And I've never known that's how you felt about me. And he said, I don't know why but I'm telling you now. He said she burst into tears and put her arms around him for the first time he could ever remember. So it was just so powerful and they all had stories like that. So yeah, it's-, it's a Yeah, and I even tell about, you know, in my early uh, career, thinking about oxytocin and dopamine chemistry that I, I wasn't, paying attention to things like giving my wife flowers. I said, oh, flowers are not gonna cause love. You know, this is oxytocin and dopamine. But then one day I realized when I give my wife flowers, I see that sparkle in her eye and she did the expression on her face. And then I can relate, you know, I, in my mind, I can think, oh, that's the dopamine that's being released. And so I convey that message of how I changed. And um, you know, they just all look at each other and they, they, they get it. So it's something about just the knowledge of the chemistry that's going on in the brain. Um, that kind of, it, it adds something so that it helps 
guide them, gives them a rationale for doing certain things rather than a counselor just saying you should do this because a psychologist says so. I, I don't even tell them what they need to do, uh, but I just give suggestions. You know, this is what I have learned. You know, I end up, I learn from nature and listen to nature. And I think that that's a very powerful thing. So do you want to say anything else? Um, what, one of the things I'm curious about, um, because there's a lot of discussion in this field about resistance to change, mm -hmm. right, or um, a, a challenge with sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. Although we're seeing declines, I wanted to chat at some point about declines that we've been seeing for decades in some settings, but um, there are uh, local beliefs um, and local sort of uh, systems of beliefs about the body um, that if you don't cut a woman, um, the clitoris will grow into a penis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if you don't cut the woman, she will be unhygienic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and hygiene is a very important principle in Islam, mm -hmm. uh, an extremely important principle in Islam. Um, so have you experienced uh, resistance among those who hold uh, strong beliefs about um, the health and hygiene and purity uh, and biology of FGMC? That, that's a question. Um, it's not resistance so much as more questions, just questions. Okay. And that's why whenever we go to a new place, and I've done this forever, mm -hmm. I let them know that I'm not here as an expert. I'm here as a sister. And I need you to teach me before I can tell you anything. I've just got information to share. So when they tell me all of those hygiene things, um, and, and many, many more, many more, and we, we get the list out and we everybody's truthful about whatever their resistant ideas would be, we address them one by one by one. Mm -hmm. And it just makes those things disappear. Like one of them, this was, wasn't hygiene, but at one of the conferences, um, a man stood up and he said, you know, now, th these we now that we've learned that these women have been really traumatized, don't you think it would be better to not go home and tell them and just leave them in ignorant bliss? And I said, there's nothing blissful about their ignorance, but you can help her by deciding together that you're not going to let this happen to your children or your grandchildren. And when, when they have an answer about things, like even the hygiene, sometimes I use myself as an example. And I, I say, do, do you think that I look clean? And they're, oh, yes, Reverend, yes, yes, yes. And I said, well, I'm not cut. Or, well, they won't be able to give birth. Well, I have three children. And having a person who is um, advocating for them, but also can speak from experience, has helped a lot. Now, one of the comments that... Uh... I thought you were going to tell the story in Tanzania, the man, who, one of the gatekeepers of tradition, when he stood up and said, hey, you know, uh, not too long ago, we wore a completely different kinds of clothes, right? And we have changed our clothes. And then sometimes culture uh, needs to change. You know, this is after I talked about how I changed my culture, you know, things that I eat so that I can live longer. I really want to live a long life. And and so um, they, they, they got that. But the, I think the, other, the, the most powerful thing for us, the way we're, we're doing it, is that you know, we're speaking to a limited number of people when we go. Um, all of those then are the ones that are carrying that message from within the community to the other people in the community. So um, you know, I'm not sure you know, how much resistance they face uh, after they... Uh, leave us and then go there. But I think it's going to be uh, much easier if it's coming from within, from within the community. So uh, they're actually teaching in the teaching my my uh, the oxytocin dopamine bonding stuff um, in hundreds of churches there. Can I? So I'm 
I'm a social scientist um, by training, and I'm thinking about the incredible social network analysis that you could do uh, to see how this message diffuses um, from leadership through their um, church organizations and perhaps diffuses out into the community. I think this is a really interesting transition to try mm -hmm. to document. You are and, welcome. And it would, be an, it would be an important one to do. Yeah. Come with yeah, so this is one of the things that I actually um, am very interested in um, trying to understand is um, what are the opportunities for research? You know, um, you know I, I can see that, uh, you know, my research here, my lab research here at Emory can have some big impact there, but I think that there is a, a opportunity for many collaborations. You know, you can think about with among, say, members of the Department of Psychiatry, uh, where um, these women, you know, we, we did experiments several years ago here, Andy Miller and Charlie Nemiroff and, and Christine Heim, uh, looking at women who uh, experienced sexual abuse as a child and uh, looking at their brain oxytocin levels as adults, and they have lower levels of oxytocin as adults. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of work being done, the Grady Trauma Project and things like that. And uh, if, if there was anyone in, in psychiatry that was interested in doing some kind of, maybe some comparative work, looking at different tribes that have different practices and things like that from a psychi psychiatric perspective, but also uh, from anthropological, global health, you know, and sociology, there's a lots of opportunities here. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, we can continue to do this. We've done it two more times. And one of the, one of the challenges is, you know, to be able to have this impact you know, we, uh, it, it takes funding to be able to bring uh, the people uh, from these far distances to and to have the the venue and the location and, and things like that. So that's one of the things that uh, at least sort of an immediate hurdle is to be able to continue to do this. But then I would love to be able to grow the sort of academic research mm -hmm. opportunity around that. Um, that would be great. Mel? So I, I just wanted to uh, clarify, um, since you mentioned Islam, Dr. Dr. Young, uh, that Islam, um, I don't know, does not require or encourage these practices. As far as we know, it, um, they existed uh, for centuries, if not millennia, before Islam came to Africa, but Islam didn't confront them uh, and, and prohibit them in both ways. You know, I'm so glad you said that, Mel, because you remember seeing the picture of Larry with the imams? Um, there was there was a slide that he had when we were in Sabay, and there was there were two imams there, but one of them was the Qadi. He was the like the bishop of all the imams in the entire region of Sabay, and we and he was at a um, a meeting of the clan leaders that our director of operations, Delmark Mangusha, went to. And he, uh, we were, I said, if you can be the last one to speak, you know, recency effect. And, and so he was the last one to speak. And he said, we're going to be having this men's conference. And here's what people have done that ha has made them decide to stop. And he talked about oxy oxytocin and bonding. And the Qadi came up to Delmark after that meeting, and he said, I have been, you know, he's Muslim. He says, I have been looking for a way to stop this in my community. And he said, I've never heard that argument. He said, why can't I come to that men's meeting? And so I had already said to Delmark, invite them to come. So we had 75 imams that came to that conference. And Larry wasn't there then, but he spoke to them because we had made some videos, little six clips, and he was able to speak. And they, um, the team there uh, unpacked it all. So, yeah, it's, it is something that there are, peop there are Muslim people who, even though it's not uh, required by the Quran, the Quran has a few places that speak about the inferiority of women that have been used to say, well, then, you know, so those are things that this Qadi is now able to address. So 
we're really happy about that. That's great. Yeah, I would just um, agree wholeheartedly that um, FGMC has been observed in a wide range of religious communities. So it would not be specific to Islam mm -hmm. or to Christianity, but has appeared in contextual ways um, with interpretations and belief systems that uh, are more local. Um, so I, I did want to clarify that. I think that's an important point to raise. And you know, and uh, in talking to people about why this arose originally, you know, like in, in many of the, the pastoral communities where the men uh, go with their uh, cattle and sheep for two months um, away from the village, and their wives are, are there. They, they sort of, I think, maybe originally this was felt as a way of keeping uh, the wife faithful, so that the husband knows that this must be his children. Um, so there's that perspective, but I, I will, will say, although I, I felt like we never got any pushback from the whole oxytocin bonding kind of thing, we always get pushback a little bit from when you were talking about equality of men and women. That that's something that's a little bit much harder to push, but I think it just it also speaks to you know. So those are two different things that are very culturally based. Um, but it we would often get feedback, uh, pushback from, you know, the idea that men and women are equal or something like that. Then, um, but, but, but much, much less so than about this biology. Mm -hmm. It just didn't happen. So anyway, um, did you guys want to have any other, uh, you have anything else to say? I really appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I'll say that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you much, so much for uh, participating and having this discussion. And thanks, everyone, uh, for attending. Um, and thanks, Patty, for coming down from Boston for this. And, uh, and great discussion, I think. OK. All right. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Now. Should have asked if any of you have any questions. Not say. Do, do, yeah, does anybody want to have, have anybody have any questions? Was it 6 30? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you have any um, data on that? Yeah, I don't know the rates of mortality. I don't know the rates of mortality um, from FGMC, but one of the challenges actually with the trends towards abandonment is that as um, people have learned about some of the health effects, uh, there has been a movement towards medicalization of the practice. Yeah. Um, so I don't have figures on uh, mortality related to FGMC, um, but I will say that um, knowledge of the health risks has led to medicalization and not just medicalization, um, with uh, um, customary practitioners using more hygienic practices, but actually medicalization where uh, um, MDs and doctors are practicing on the side. Um, and there are economics of the practice that are very complicated um, and I think are important things to address um, uh, because the practitioners are often women and it's a source of income for those women. Um, but also many physicians in practicing settings um, aren't earning incomes and often have second jobs in the private sector. Um, so there's, an, there's a sort of a political economy of this that I think it's important to recognize. So that's a, away from your question. I don't know mortality rates, but concerns about the health effects have led to a movement to uh, sustain the PAC practice without the same health effects. And that's it. Uh, um, I don't know the number, but they are there. Um, I was speaking to one of our colleagues in Tanzania uh, last week, and she was saying that it's far more prevalent than people think, um, but they have myths for why it happened. Uh, we talked about how the Larry said how a girl might have looked um, with lust at a boy or maybe and and it's it's very shaming the girl dies and she her shame continues on after her death 
for no good reason, but the family is also shamed. Um, and sometimes they say, well, the goddess uh, didn't care for th this particular girl, so she wouldn't accept her and she let her die. Or they'll, they, they'll say all kinds of things because other than it shouldn't have happened and that uh, w one of the things that Domily does are the nurse who she talks about how it happens because these people have no experience and they you know you cut an artery and you can't stop it so thanks for the question any other question Arlie Um, that science is very powerful in um, helping people understand maybe the consequences of those acts and everything. Do you think scientists have a responsibility to communicate their science maybe outside of specific publication and make our discovery more accessible to the general population? Because we have a tendency of like just communicate, communicating about, amongst ourselves. Do you think this is something that we need to change and address to make sure that that type of knowledge about oxytocin, for example, can be more easily accessible? Who wants to answer that? I absolutely want to. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so, so glad you brought that up. Um, and, um, you know, there's controversy about the extent to which uh, scholars and academics step across the line and begin to advocate. Um, uh, even from an evidence base of their own research. Um, our group is actually, and this is another reason why I'm so glad you brought up the constellation of um, violent practices. Our group has moved from observational research over many years into intervention research um, and have developed uh, social norms-based programs that we are delivering uh, to promote the, the, the primary prevention of uh, certain forms of violence, sexual violence in particular. Um, and having demonstrated efficacy of those programs, we are very interested in something called implementation science, where you work with institutions and entities to try to support uh, the dissemination of the programming to bring it to scale. So we're now involved in um, a, a national implementation trial where we have partnered with uh, multiple entities in Vietnam uh, for violence prevention programming. And I wanted to plant that seed because I can imagine modules being created mm -hmm. with your work that could be disseminated at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really exciting. Yeah, so um, related to that, uh, the couple, the gynecologist and the nurse, Domily and Antabat, who, who uh, helped organize those hospital conferences, they've just started a the first uh, state, you know, Uganda-wide health news channel because they felt that there's just not any, there's not a good source of information about health. And so they're doing all kinds of, of health-related uh, stuff on that, that, that channel. And uh, sometime over the next month or so, we're, I'm going to do a, you know, a recorded um, you know, video session, uh, sort of like what I did at that, uh, in that news program. Um, by the way, that, if we would have watched the rest of that, uh, you would be able to see a lot of the nurses and things that they said that one of the things that they got out of this was not, it's not about FGM, but really about, you know, even they should not treat the patient so mechanically. Mm -hmm. But treating them as a human being and, and you know eliciting oxytocin that can might help the healing power so it, it so it, it it's it's uh, there's a there's a larger message there and anyway yeah so we're going to be uh, filming that and then that will be sort of looping from time to time on that station but uh, yeah so this was one of the big hesitancies of, of of me getting involved in this because it is so different from what I normally do I normally you know try to give talks and try to be you know as technical and you know, talk about the scientific advances that, that we've made, but but I do see that there is so much value in what we have learned that can be communicated in not such a technical way, but that can help, uh, you know, sort of change the way people think about the way they behave, not telling people what they should or should not do, but to help them give something to, to, to imagine that will help them guide their behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's what's so, so powerful about this. So. So I, I was just going to um, 
in terms of spreading scientific evidence, I don't want to get you in more trouble, Dr. Carter. Uh, uh, Reverend Carter. But uh, there is uh, evidence, I think it's pretty good evidence, that the best way to spend a, a development aid dollar is on educating girls. Yeah. You educate a girl, you increase her lifetime income, her health quality, her children's health, her children's education, her husband's uh, health. And um, the ramifications are, are amazing. I, I haven't looked at them all, but um, uh, that, that is very good. Thank you for bringing that up because we know that. And from the very first conference we had in Sabay, Delmark Mangusho kept pushing me you can't just love them and leave them. You can't just tell these girls and these these men and women this story and then not help them. Uh, the, the girls are lifted up. They're empowered to learn this message. But in order to keep that power, they need economic help. So we started, we got a small grant from the Finnish government and we started 11 groups where we took girls whose parents uh, signed a contract saying they will not force their girls to be cut. Um, mm -hmm. And we ta taught them sewing skills. And we taught hairdressing skills. And we've built three bakeries. So the, they're making commercial bread. And what has happened is that these girls are so empowered now um, that they are, their fathers don't want to marry them off early because once in these areas if a girl gets married everything she produces belongs to the husband's family no longer to the father's family but a father is incentivized to have her girl cut and then marry very soon because he gets a higher bride price for a cut girl or he did not so much now um, and he'll have money there's no social security there your bride price for your daughter is part of your social security. So when the girl can has a skill that she's bringing money into the family, it makes all the difference. And so they are, we're not just giving them the information. We're also, we're, we have 26 groups now because it takes time again, like money, you have to provide the money, but the stories are so amazing of how, these little sewing groups have changed girls' lives. They're making school uniforms.